Okay, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to UAB Pathology Grand Rounds and our first ever trainee short talk session. So this is the second to last session um, for this season before we go on the summer break, and then we'll start back up in the fall, and that flyer will be coming out um, in a month or so. So today's format is a bit different than what we're used to, but I hope you'll agree that it's an important thing to give this showcase to um, our junior family members in the department. So I will not be giving full introductions for each of the speakers. You should have received an email from Laura that has all their short bios for their background. What I will do is simply say their name, the title of their talk, and then they will share their screen. I have instructed each of the speakers to talk for about five to seven minutes to allow a few minutes for questions before we move to the next speaker. And there'll be a timer going on um, behind me or in my profile picture to kind of help keep us to time, unlike what we did last week. Um, so please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Hannah Kutschall, who will tell us the path to path virtual landscape during the COVID-19 pandemic, preparing for the 2020 pathology residency recruitment season. Thank you for getting us started, Hannah. Thank you. I'll get my screen shared here. Okay. And all righty. Okay, so as he mentioned, my project was the path to path virtual landscape during COVID-19 and how that prepared for preparing for 2020 residency recruitment season. Okay, so some background on this project. On May 11th, 2020, the AAMC released recommendations that all residency interviews be conducted virtually and that away electives be discouraged. So this project focused on the hashtag path to path approach and their use of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, virtual open houses, and virtual sub internships by residency programs as means to reach out to applicants since they no longer had the in person opportunities for interpersonal relationships. Okay, for methods, we looked at a total of 138 pathology residency programs, and each of these programs were analyzed for their use of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or other virtual opportunities, such as virtual open houses and sub internships through either departmental or residency accounts. All of these accounts were analyzed by October 30th, 2020. Okay, so as you can tell from this graph, this is the number of pathology social media accounts that were created by type from 2010 to 2020. In blue is Twitter, in orange is Instagram, and in gray is Facebook. So as you can tell, in 2020, there is a sharp increase in the social media accounts created. And here in this table is the number of social media pages that were by type that were created after March 1st, 2020. We counted March 1st as the kind of cutoff time that we analyzed by since that was when COVID-19 really got um, labeled as a national emergency and a global pandemic. So there are a total of 132 social media accounts that we looked at across all 138 programs and 46 of those were created after March 1st. So that's 34.8%. The majority of those being the departmental Twitter accounts, departmental Instagram accounts, and then there are a few residency Twitter and residency Instagram with the fewest being Facebook at only 4% for departmental and residency. Okay, this table shows the number of programs using each social media outlet by region, and these regions were determined based on U.S. Census. So this first category here just shows the total number of programs in each area, with the largest being in the Northeast, uh, closely followed by the South, though. But across all regions, the highest social media outlet used was Twitter, and then second, either Instagram in the Northeast or Facebook in the South and pretty similar West and Midwest with the islands did not have any social media usage. Okay, so this table shows number of programs with virtual open house and sub internship opportunities that are advertised on these different social media outlets. So as you can see, there are a total of uh, 35 uh, kind of advertised on Twitter, 13 on Instagram and 12 on Facebook. So Twitter again is being used the most in these uh, opportunities for reaching out to applicants. 
And then there were 15 programs that offered more than one virtual open house, and then two that offered virtual sub internships. One of those programs offered across all three social media outlets. Okay, so where does UAB fall in this? UAB has a departmental Twitter and Instagram account. Both were created after March 1st, 2020. And then UAB offered a total of four virtual open houses on its departmental Twitter account and two virtual open houses on its Instagram account. So future directions for this study, we're kind of using this study as the basis for a follow-up post-match analysis that we're completing now. Uh, this post-match analysis is being done through a survey that has been sent out to all the residency program directors who had social media usage, either on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and they were contacted through these different outlets. And then the survey just kind of says how they thought social media impacted their ranking of different applicants and if they actually used, who, who showed up to virtual open houses, who did uh, different ways of reaching out virtually. And then also these surveys were made available to the medical students who matched into the 2021 match cycle to see if it affected how they ranked programs since they're no longer able to see the schools in person, no longer able to interact in person with the different um, fellow applicants, residents, or the program directors. Okay, and here's my references for this project and I can take any questions. That was perfect. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, I'll ask the first one. Obviously, these are trying times and whatever tools we have available are great. Um, are you able to also track the metrics? So obviously, you, you highlighted the number of accounts. Were you able to track um, how efficiently they were either retweeted or actually examined, engaged with? So that's kind of what we were thinking of in the post-match analysis is where okay. part of the survey is just like how much did the program directors, did they actually look at this? Did they use it? Um, did they track who saw what on their social media accounts? So that kind of falls into the post-match. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect, great. Anybody else have a question for Hannah? Okay, great. So if you will unshare um, and then like, there, oh, yes. Here's the chat. Oh, is there one in the chat? Sorry, Thank I you. see it. Be able to look at data from non-virtual recruitment from prior years. Um, and maybe so I can I'm, clarify a little. Um, so it's to see, you know, the impact of virtual on the whole process. It would be nice to be able to look at previous years, but that would be difficult if the survey that you have is significantly different from, you know, surveys from other years. Right, yeah, that would be difficult. Our survey is mostly focusing all on, yeah, the different social media outlets they used. Um, there are very few post match. Yeah, so Dr. McCleskey is also the um, head person on this investigation as well. And she, yeah, there's very few post match analysis kind of before this. So we're just focusing specifically on the social media um, use of it. Great, thank you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving on to um, Julia Zebro, who will tell us about orthogonal targeting of epigenomic resistance mechanisms to EGFR inhibition in glioblastoma. Thank you, Julia. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay. So the title of my talk is Orthogonal Targeting of Epigenetic Resistance Mechanisms to EGFR Inhibition in Glioblastoma. So glioblastoma is the most common primary malignant brain tumor in adults, and patient outcomes are very poor due to the highly aggressive and diffusely invasive nature of these tumors, as well as the high degree of inter- and intratumoral heterogeneity. Current standard of care for GBM includes resection, radiation, and treatment with temozolomide, but the mean survival is only 15 months. Epidermal growth factor receptor, or EGFR, is a receptor tyrosine kinase amplified in over half of all GBM, and as such, it represents an attractive therapeutic target. It is also the basis for the single most common activating mutation in GBM, EGFR-V3. This aberrant activation of EGFR drives overactivation of downstream RAS and PI3 kinase pathways, resulting in cancer phenotypes such as increased survival, proliferation, and angiogenesis. 
Though targeting EGFR has been successful in other cancers, such as non-small cell lung cancer, clinical trials with first-generation EGFR inhibitors in both the first and second line therapy settings have failed in GBM. This is in part due to the fact that patients were not mutationally selected for these studies and that the drugs had poor CNS penetrance, but other major problems include intrinsic and acquired resistance. Oncogenic EGFR signaling strongly and persistently activates PI3 kinase signaling and results in pathway addiction. P10, a negative regulator of PI3 kinase signaling, is commonly lost or mutated in GBM, about 40 to 50%. And EGFR V3 and P10 co-expression was significantly associated with clinical response to EGFR inhibitors. Thus, P10 loss represents one mechanism of resistance. However, other mechanisms of re adaptive resistance to EGFR inhibition remain understudied. Based on this mutational profile, we created genetically engineered mouse astrocyte models driven by EGFR V3 and then with P P10 loss or P10 wild type. Now, these cells form GBM when orthotopically injected into mice, indicating that they are a good model of GBM. To investigate the adaptive response of these cells to EGFR inhibition, we treated them with neratinib, an EGFR inhibitor currently in GBM clinical trials, and assayed the transcriptome using RNA-seq. On the left, you can see that P10 status heavily influences the acute kinase transcriptome response to neratinib, and on the right, you see activation of oncogenic kinases common to both the wild P10 wild type and P10 deleted models, as well as others that are specific to each model. Thus, the repertoire of activated kinases is also highly dependent on P10 status. We're particularly interested in the activated kinases because these genes could represent targets for dual kinase inhibition therapies. However, these have yet to be biologically validated in these models. And while targeting individual kinases could represent a whack-a-mole strategy, when an additional kinase is inhibited, others would become activated, targeting an orthogonal mechanism could improve durability of EGFR uh, inhibitor response. Targeting the epigenome is particularly promising due to its mechanistic control of gene expression. The acute and robust nature of the transcriptional response to neratinib in our models strongly suggests remodeling of the enhancer landscape including redistribution of active enhancer markers and de novo seeding of strongly activating super enhancer elements proximal to key resistance genes. Members of the BET bromo domain family of chromatin readers, such as BRD4 shown here, bind H3K27 acetyl-rich enhancer regions and recruit the transcription elongation complex. Thus, BET family members and elongation complex components, as well as histone deacetylases, represent possible druggable targets to attenuate this resistance response. The BET inhibitor molibrescive was found to synergize with neratinib in both our P10 wild type and P10 deleted models in vitro, further implicating neratinib induced enhancer remodeling. This brings me to my hypotheses that the expression of either shared or P10 status specific genes, including oncogenic kinases, confers resistance to neratinib, and that enhancer remodeling represents a master mechanism regulating this adaptive transcriptional response. For AIM-1, I will identify genes contributing to neuratinib resistance of GBM cells with and without P10 loss. Based on my RNA-seq results in our mouse astrocyte models, I propose a genome-wide CRISPR knockout screen. This screen will allow me to identify in the control or no drug arm genes essential for cell survival, and then in the negative screen arm with neratinib, I will be able to identify oncogene resistance drivers. Some of these would be our targets for potential dual kinase inhibition. In the positive screen, I will be able to identify tumor suppressor genes conferring drug sensitivity. I could also potentially identify other epigenetic targets driving the adaptive response. So for AIM-2, I will determine whether neratinib induces P10-dependent reorganization of the enhancer landscape, leading to differential transcriptional activation of resistance drivers. Characterization of the adaptive response requires detailed knowledge of the transcriptome and enhancer landscape at baseline with no drug and in response to single and dual agent perturbation. You've already seen that I've used RNA-seq to assay the transcriptome. To assay the epigenome, I will use cut and run, a chromatin immunocleavage method that yields results similar to CHIP-seq. And I will do this for the markers H3K27 acetyl and BRD4, which mark enhancers and super enhancers. Using these tools, I will complete these sub-aims to define the baseline enhancer landscapes in our P10 wild type and deleted models, 
to determine whether neratinib induces remodeling of the enhancer landscape at shared NP10 status specific loci. This analysis will be focused on those genomic loci that were identified in the um, CRISPR screen. And finally, to determine whether molybrasib, a BET inhibitor, attenuates neratinib-induced enhancer remodeling and transcriptional activation of key resistance drivers in a P10-dependent manner. These are my acknowledgments, and with that, I'll take any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so we have one question in the chat. Um, worth exploring EZH2 inhibitors as well that are in clinical trials. There are studies implicating it in EGRF mutated tumors, EZH2 is a histone H3 trimethylase. And I actually, I think I saw it on your one image. So mm -hmm. um, I have one question. So I'm definitely a transcriptional biologist. So I love that you're doing that transcriptional work. Have you thought about bringing in um, one of the kinoma, kinoma rays that we have here at UAB? Have you looked uh, into the kinomic core? For, I have not. Um, for protein, you mean? For protein level? Yeah, so it's um, directed by um, uh, Chris Willey and Josh Anderson. And they mm -hmm. actually, it's basically an array of kinase activity assay. So mm -hmm. you can actually see the functional output of those, but great project. Any other questions for Julia? Yeah, um, in response to that, there is, oh, um, um, so there is a, um, like an inhibitor and bead-based pull-down method that's been used um, at UNC and other members of my lab have used this in their projects to look at the, the protein level. And some of the RNA-seq data with some of the earlier EGFR inhibitors has shown that some, some um, genes are responsive at the transcript level, but others uh, are only responsive at the protein level, and then some are both. So that affects um, the way that we choose to target those. Great. Great. For okay. your A1, Julia? Yes. Uh, how, how many targets do you think um, you're going to identify if you were going to guess? That's a good question. So we will probably identify um, a great many that are. Um, just necessary for cell survival in terms of the neuratinib treatment. Um, I don't really know, but I know that I'm going to focus potentially on, um, I mean, I'll use the, uh, the hits as guidance for where I look in the genome for the um, enhancer remodeling, um, but I'll also be interested in those other epigenetic targets. So um, if they have, for example, EZH2 and other things that pop out there that could guide our studies for other mechanisms, epigenetic mechanisms. Great, thank you, great talk. Thank you. Great, yeah, definitely look forward to seeing the progress in your project. Okay, thank you. So we will move on to uh, Richard Godby. And we'll be changing gears again, where he will tell us about adaptable stewardship during a pandemic collaborating to care for individuals with sickle cell disease. Well, thank you all for having me and listening to our research here. So I was unaware uh, before I started this fellowship, but UAB uses a lot of packed red blood cells um, just in fiscal year 21 alone, which is basically from October, 2020 uh, until April of 2021 thus far. UAB as a whole has used over 24,000 units of packed red cells. And in particular, the hematology department uses has used over 5,800 units, accounting for over a quarter of UAB's total blood usage. And if you subdivide that into inpatient and outpatient, they actually have used almost two thirds of their blood um, in the outpatient setting. And kind of one of the reasons why we think this is happening is that UAB has invested a lot into their sickle cell disease program. And they've done a lot of outreach and a lot of um, faculty recruitment and it's, it's turned into a marvelous program for the community. And so the transfusion medicine uh, and apheresis service plays a huge role in that by assisting with red blood cell exchanges, which is essentially where we try to decrease the amount of hemoglobin S um, and uh, optimize their hematocrit with an apheresis machine. Um, another thing that I learned <laughs> after starting this fellowship um, is that there's more than ABO on a red cell. And so just like any other antigen, 
um, when you expose an individual to an antigen that they don't have, they can make an antibody to it. And that's kind of a concept to refer to as alloimmunization. And there are a few, um, uh, there are a few uh, receptors on the red cell that are more immunogenic than others, particularly ones that we call big C, big K, and big E. And those can induce uh, a response to where the person receiving that red cell can make an antibody to it if they don't have that um, receptor themselves. Additionally, those patients with sickle cell disease are more likely to do that. And it's thought to be due to an underlying chronic inflammatory state. And so there's typically issues with getting enough blood to do these exchanges without a pandemic. And then once the pandemic kind of hit, there were national blood product shortages and alterations in the supply chain, as well as physical distancing requirements that not only affected donation, but affected the apheresis suite in Jefferson Towers, where we do the exchanges in terms of keeping everyone safe and distance and asking them to wear masks. And so in order to overcome this, uh, teamwork was vitally important, whether it be from the blood product suppliers who held additional community blood drives and engaged with the community and had to implement multiple safety strategies as well as optimizing their supply chain to, to not only get the blood, but to get it to the right places. And then the communities themselves had to increase their donation efforts. They had to postpone surgeries and they had to wear masks and do physical distancing. And at UAB, all the blood product utilizers had to come together and uh, re-examine how they were using blood. And part of the way that the blood bank assisted with that is we teamed up with some of the hematologists, particularly on the sickle cell disease team to figure out who needed exchanges and when. Anytime an individual was admitted to the inpatient setting, a sickle cell disease consult was placed in order to determine if they needed blood or not. Um, and uh, we did surgical postponements um, as well. And we started tracking our inventory here at the blood bank and sharing that throughout the hospital. Um, so everyone could kind of have an understanding of where the inventory was. Um, we had to make certain red cell exchange accommodations. And so if a patient had um, COVID, we had to get extension tubing uh, to do the exchange outside of the, the room in order to conserve PPE for the hospital. And so in putting all these efforts together, um, if you look here at the top line, this is the number of packed red cells ordered for inpatient surgeries. <clears throat> the bottom here is the number of red cell units ordered for um, red cell exchanges. And pre-pandemic, uh, the inpatient surgeries used a lot of blood. And as elective procedures came down, they used less, obviously, and we were able to take that in the setting of a national shortage and maintain um, the same number of red cell exchanges in the outpatient setting for our patients with sickle cell disease. And so looking pre-pandemic and intra-pandemic, there was no difference in the amount of exchanges that we performed. And we were actually able to share our experience by writing this up with our hematology oncology colleagues. So thank you very much. Um, that was perfect, perfect timing as well. Um, one question, uh, and I know there's some investigators in the department that have looked at the age of the blood and the outcomes there. Oh, Rakesh, do you want to ask the question? <laughs> well, I don't know what question you were going to ask, Adam, but I'll, um, I'll ask uh, my own. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rich. So in, in terms of the, have you been able to ascertain from your data whether or not after things have opened back up, whether the 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 use of red cells for these elective surgeries, you know, per surgery has gone down because at all, you know, this, this issue of liberal use versus more conservative use or has practice changed at all as a consequence of, of uh, COVID in that respect? We have not studied that or crunched the data, but my gestalt is that we are uh, approaching pre-pandemic uh, okay. usage. So it's correlating just with the number of surgeries rather than um, the number of units per surgery. Yes, yes. Okay. Pe people, people are not shy about using blood. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. There was job security there, right? <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> 
it was definitely your work that I was thinking about when I was going to ask my question. And mine had more so to do with the age, because after hearing Dr. Patel's work in the past, when I go into the doctor's office and they ask you, would you be willing to take a transfusion? I always uh, want to add the disclaimer about the age of the blood um, based on some of the outcomes. And have you noticed any difference in that as far as the time to use? So we, we try to we try to get them um, relatively fresh blood, but in general, the concept of storage lesions is fascinating, but it hasn't really been shown as a whole to affect clinical outcomes. But for these individuals, the, the primary thing that we work on is getting them um, antigen matched blood so that we prevent alloimmunization. And it really becomes an issue when they get transfusions at multiple hospitals in the community. And it's kind of difficult because most institutions antigen match, but not all. And so you have to, you have to watch for that. Okay. I need to get one last question. Um, does history of HLA antibodies interfere with CAR T therapy? Uh, I will have to look into that, Dr. Vidal, but my understanding is not at this point. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So our next speaker is Dominique Henshaw, who's going to tell us about hedgehog signaling programs, metabolic circuitries that craft alternative polarization of mammary tumor associated macrophages. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you so much um, for the to the pathology ground rounds for the opportunity to present my work. Um, so my project focuses on the hedgehog signaling pathway, and this is a developmental signaling pathway that's been shown to be aberrantly upregulated in breast cancer. Um, in our studies, we utilize different inhibitors to target this pathway. Specifically, we use bismotigib and BMS to target the signaling transducer smoothin and get 61 to target the transcription factor glee. So we study breast cancer, but it's important to remember that the tumor is not alone and the tumor microenvironment includes many other cell types which can develop a crosstalk with the tumor cells. And with this crosstalk, the tumor can reprogram an ideally tumor suppressive microenvironment to become tumor promoting. And we're interested in the role of hedgehog signaling in this crosstalk. Specifically, we propose to study M2 macrophages as a high presence of these cell types within the tumor correlate with a poor patient prognosis. So macrophages can exist in a continuum of functional states, but for simplicity, I'll focus on M1 and M2 macrophages, which represent the extremes of this continuum. So monocytes are polarized to either M1 or M2, depending on cytokines and the surrounding microenvironment. And M1 macrophages have an anti-tumor phenotype, whereas M2 macrophages have a pro-tumor phenotype. So preliminary data from our lab indicates that hedgehog signaling blockade alters the immune portfolio of mammary tumors. So we utilize two independent mammary cancer mouse models in which mice were administered with either a vehicle control or the hedgehog inhibitor vismotigib for three weeks. And then we mapped the tumor infiltrating macrophages via flow cytometry. So what we found is that in mice treated with vismotigib, there's a significant decrease in tumor infiltrating M2 macrophages, with a complementary increase in M1 macrophages in both models. Also, in vitro studies, um, we found that the treatment of M2 macrophages with exogenous hedgehog ligand um, led to increased expression of M2-specific markers, arginase-1 and CD206, and this was diminished when we inhibited M2 macrophages for hedgehog signaling, indicating that hedgehog signaling promotes the M2 phenotype. So this led us to ask, how does hedgehog signaling mechanistically regulate the M2 phenotype? So to uncover this mechanism, we utilized our in vivo model that I just outlined and performed RNA sequencing on the bulk tumor mass. We did pathway analysis and saw that several metabolic pathways were significantly regulated by hedgehog blockade. And we also confirmed that hedgehog blockade altered the metabolic profile specifically of macrophages by performing RNA sequencing on M2 polarized raw cells treated with or without hedgehog inhibitors. So to uncover which metabolic pathways hedgehog signaling was regulating, we performed untargeted metabolomics on M2 macrophages inhibited for hedgehog signaling. And from this data found that the UDP glutenide biosynthesis pathway was a top hit. So this pathway is depicted here along with the concentration of each metabolite. And UDP glutenac is a substrate for a process called oglutenaclation in which an enzyme called OGT adds glycanide moieties to proteins and OGA removes them. 
So this then led us to ask if hedgehog signaling was regulating O-gluten acylation in M2 macrophages. So to answer this question, we immunoblotted M2 macrophages treated with DMSO or hedgehog inhibitors and saw a significant reduction in O-gluten acylation in M2 macrophages with hedgehog blockade. And similarly, we register reduced protein and transcript levels of OGT, again, the enzyme that adds the glutenac moieties. We also replicated these findings using M2 TAMs sorted from mouse memory tumors of two immunocompetent mouse models um, shown here in the immunoblots below. So now that we've established a role for hedgehog signaling in regulating oglycnaclation in M2 macrophages, our next question was how does hedgehog signaling's regulation of oglycnaclation impact the M2 phenotype? And so to answer this question, we turn to the transcription factor STAT6, which is a master transcription factor of the M2 phenotype. So to determine if STAT6 was in fact oglycnaclated in the M2 macrophages, we performed immunoprecipitation, pulling down all oglycnaclated proteins and then probe for STAT6. We registered a decrease of oglycnaclated STAT6 in M2 macrophages treated with hedgehog inhibitors. So next, we incorporated an inhibitor of OGT into our studies called OSMY1 and saw that when M2 macrophages were inhibited for OGT at increasing concentrations, we saw a dose-dependent reduction in STAT6 activity. Also, M2-specific markers, arginase-1 and CD206, were decreased in transcript expression with OGT blockade. So then we asked, does STAT6 impact other metabolic pathways in these macrophages? And so the answer to this is yes. Um, in particular, it's reported that STAT6 plays a role in governing fatty acid oxidation, which is a characteristic M2 metabolic signature by directly upregulating the expression of PGC1 beta and PPAR gamma, which then act as cofactors co for SAT6 to initiate the transcription of genes important for the fatty acid oxidation pathway. So we wanted to see if inhibition of oglycnaclation and hedgehog, signa hedgehog signaling independently altered the expression of genes directly involved in fatty acid oxidation. And in both cases, we register a decrease in the genes critical for fatty acid oxidation. And we confirmed this with a seahorse fatty acid oxidation assay and registered that both basal and maximal oxygen consumption rate is reduced with M2s inhibited for hedgehog uh, signaling, confirming that there is a reduction in cellular fatty acid oxidation. So overall, our work demonstrates a critical role for hedgehog signaling in controlling the metabolic regulation of M2 macrophages in addition to their phenotypic and functional polarization. So with that, I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Lolita Samant and lab members, as well as my committee. Also like to thank our collaborators and the department um, for their help and expertise and UAB's core facilities. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great talk. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, were you able to look at the other family members in PGC, PPAR? So was PGC1 alpha also changed or was PRC changed? So we haven't looked at the other um, family members specifically because um, in, in this case, STAT6 um, is a coactivator with PPAR gamma um, specifically and PGC1 beta. So that's why we focus on these. Okay. Any other questions for Dominique? Okay, well, thank you. That's a very complete study. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have um, Sarah DePew who will tell us, or will hopefully answer the question, can we come to the same conclusion? The utility of autopsy findings when determining causes and manners of death. Sarah. Hey everybody. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank all of the people listed here, especially Dr. McCluskey for nominating me. So a little bit of background, ME offices have been questioning the utility of the autopsy uh, in all cases in maybe the last decade as case burden has significantly increased due to staffing shortages, but mostly due to the opioid crisis. And now also we have the COVID-19 pandemic to deal with. So NAME, the National Association of Medical Examiners, posts or publishes the forensic autopsy performance standards, which are the standards that forensic pathologists use to determine when an autopsy is needed. B3.7 is maybe the standard that gives offices the most increase in burden, as this is the standard that determines or that mandates that a autopsy should be done in an overdose death. 
So we wanted to we wanted to see if a forensic pathologist can come to the same conclusion with or without internal examination findings in certain cases. So we identified 15 cases from the Jefferson County Medical Examiner's database, five drug-related accidental deaths, five homicides, and five natural deaths. The natural deaths also have positive toxicology results, just to kind of throw a wrench into things. Then we designed two sets of vignettes. So we designed restricted vignettes, which include a short history, external examination, and toxicology findings. And we also designed unrestricted vignettes, which are the same, but they also have all the internal examination findings as well. So then we uh, found our respondents, over 100 people wanted to participate, and we sent them the vignettes, and we sent them 15 vignettes, all of which were either restricted or unrestricted. We wanted two answers from our respondents. We wanted a manner of death and a cause of death. Manner of death is standardized in the forensic world. It can be accident, suicide, homicide, natural, and undetermined. So that was easy to codify for statistical analysis purposes. It was just codified as one to five. Uh, cause of death, we let them free text answer so they could put whatever they want. So we had to go through, find each unique identifier and give it a code. For example, if you answered HIV AIDS, that's a code of 15. I've broken down our results into manner of death results and cause of death results. So for our manner of death results, I'm gonna talk about accidents and homicides together because they were almost the same. So the majority of people recognize that all of our, all five of our accident vignettes and all five of our homicide vignettes were accidents and homicides. There were only three vignettes, two for accident and one for homicide that had a significant difference between the two groups of responders. The natural deaths, kind of the same story, uh, even better, the majority recognize these deaths as natural for all vignettes. Uh, the unrestricted group actually had unanimous consensus, so 100% that the banner of death was natural for three out of four vignettes. And then there were three out of four vignettes that had a significant difference. There's an undetermined vignette, and you might say you haven't mentioned an undetermined vignette. That's because our respondents actually decided that one of the vignettes we had classified as natural was undetermined. So here's an example of our tables from that data. I'm going to point out two vignettes to you. So this is vignette one, and here's our manners of death on the left. So for vignette one, 85% of the restricted group thought that this was an accident, and 98.9% .9 of the unrestricted group thought that this was an accident. So that was a statistically significant increase. However, most of our vignettes for manner of death actually looked like number two, where it wasn't statistically different. In fact, it was the same. 96.5% of the restricted group thought this was a homicide and 96.5% of the unrestricted group thought that this was a homicide. So now I'm gonna get into our cause of death results. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about accidents and homicides again, because they were very similar. So for four out of five vignettes, there was no difference in the classification between the groups for accidents and homicides. And one of each, there was a statistically significant difference. For the cause of death results, for our natural deaths, <laughs> this is interesting, in four out of four vignettes, there was no consensus whatsoever for cause of death determination between the restricted and the unrestricted groups. Only one out of four elicited the same cause of death from the highest percentage of both groups of respondents, that was diabetes. Uh, for our unrestricted vignette, the, the vignette that um, our respondents decided was un undetermined. Uh, individuals from the unrestricted group more, th more so than the restricted group classified the cause of death as drug overdose. So I didn't show you any tables from our accidents or our um, homicide deaths, but here's two examples of our natural vignettes. So vignette seven was very interesting. It was the only vignette where the percent consensus actually went down <laughs> in our unrestricted group. So when they had access to the internal examination findings, uh, so 58.7% of the restricted group thought that this was due to hypertensive heart disease, as opposed to 46% of the unrestricted group thought this was cardiomegaly. Then yet nine, there was a higher, uh, there, a majority was achieved in the unrestricted group, uh, but it went from 47.6% thought it was HIV AIDS to 64% thought it was acute bronchopneumonia. And again, no majority consensus was achieved in the unrestricted group, and that was the only vignette of its kind. So discussion, uh, answer, to answer my original question, can we come to the same conclusion on manner of death? So there was a near unanimous consensus on the manner of death in the unrestricted group when they had access to the internal examination findings with a median of 97.6%. 
the consensus decreases for manner of death was largely driven by the restricted group. So it did increase with the internal examination findings, but it wasn't statistically significant in most cases. So I would say that the answer to this question is yes. So same question, can we come to the same conclusion, but this time on cause of death results? So I would say in homicides and accidents, uh, consensus was achieved greater than 70% by both groups. Uh, it was only statistically significant difference between restricted and unrestricted respondents in two cases, one accident and one homicide. However, the highest achieved consensus for our natural deaths was 74% for cause of death by the restricted group. So full autopsy does not seem to increase consensus in cause of death for natural deaths. So the answer to this question is it depends. So our goal with this study is really to start a discussion about re-examining NAME's forensic autopsy performance standards to be more in line with the needs and capabilities of Amy's offices in 2021 and beyond. And thank you for listening. And if anybody has any questions, I will try to answer them. <laughs> Great, so you have one question from Dr. Worthy in the chat. Is there an age of patient effect? Is it harder to be correct when patients are older due to comorbidities? Um, so maybe, and um, so in some of these, let me get back to this table. So in some of our natural vignettes, um, a lot of times, like, so this person in vignette nine did have HIV AIDS and acute bronchopneumonia. Um, so when they do have multiple things going on, so people just ascribed more importance to one or the other. So that that could be true. I, I, I haven't looked into that. That could be a possible cause. Sometimes people were in the same ballpark, like for vignette seven, uh, hypertensive heart disease versus cardiomegaly, but sometimes they weren't in the same ballpark. I'm not really sure why, really. <laughs> no, that's very interesting. Um, with the uh, one vignette that went from natural to undetermined, does that then bring it back to legal? Does it then go into some investigation in a case like that? Or is it just anecdotal and move on? I, I think it's anecdotal and move on. Um, so it was a natural, we had classified it as a natural death. And but there were drugs on board, because like I said, all of my natural vignettes had drugs on board. So we class we decided that it was more due to the natural causes and the drugs were just contributing. Whereas a small majority, I think it was 52% of the unrestricted group decided that it was more to do with the drugs. It was more of an overdose with the natural problems contributing. And that could be a difference in medical examiner office culture as well. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Okay, and thank you all for staying on time. We did. Uh, we have our last speaker, um, Thomas uh, Dechamedi, I hope I pronounced it correctly, who will tell us about the translational diagnostic advancements targeting SARS-CoV-2. Thank you, Thomas. All right, can everybody see this? Yes. All righty. Thank you for the short introduction. Uh, and I want to also thank Dr. Sixto Leo and the Pathology Grand Rounds Committee for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. So my talk outline, I'm going to briefly go over some past and current work that I've been doing uh, since I've joined the Fungal Reference Lab. Uh, the first two topics, the flu and SARS multiplex and the extraction free kits that we had the opportunity of uh, testing out. And then finish up with some ongoing research, subgenomic RNA detection and variant sequencing for SARS-CoV-2. So flu and SARS-CoV-2, as the pandemic was approaching flu season, we needed to get a diagnostic test that would target both pathogens, flu and SARS-CoV-2. And in order to uh, provide appropriate therapy, we needed to uh, incorporate the flu uh, primer and probe sequences. So we used the CDC primer probe sequences, incorporated them into the existing SARS-CoV-2 uh, PCR assay, which gave us one test with two results. Uh, the LOD, limit of detection for this, we got 125 copies per mil uh, for both uh, N1 and the flu AB primer probe sequences, and then the LOD confirmation on the right there. Uh, for the specificity portion of the validation, we needed to get uh, no cross-reaction with any other uh, common respiratory pathogens, so we had a bacterial, fungal, and viral 
uh, panels that we all uh, screened against and did not amplify any of these. And finally, to get the full validation, we needed to get positive agreement and negative agreement, which we were 100% on both uh, positive remnant samples for flu and then some negative samples on the right there. Uh, so all of this requires RNA extraction, um, but some, sometimes supply chain can get caught up like we saw in the heat of the pandemic. Um, so there's companies that came out and made extraction free kits so you can circumvent around this RNA extraction. So we had the uh, opportunity to work with Kaijin and BioGX and test out some of their kits. So here's some brief uh, overview of the workflow for the Kaijin kit. It's about an hour, 12 minutes, they say, overall. Uh, in reality, it took about two hours for a full plate. So uh, you, you take the sample, you heat treat it, add it to a preparation buffer, and then add that to your reaction mix and into your quant studio is what we use in our lab. Um, with the, depending on how much, how many samples you have, this, it could be, you know, right on the dot with what they say, but for a full plate, it takes a little longer. So just depending on how many samples you have, but either way, you're getting around RNA extraction here. Same difference with BioGX, uh, very high throughput workflow. You just have a, a lyophilized uh, re reagent. You rehydrate it with water, uh, aliquot it into a 96 well plate, and then take your sample, add that right into that mix, into your quant studio, and then you've got detection. Uh, this was a little quicker than the Kaijin kit, just because there's less mixes and uh, less prep work you have to do. Uh, it's a little under two hours, and depending on how many samples you have, this can be bumped down. Uh, so to test out these kits, we wanted to get an LOD, just like we did for our test. So uh, it was a pretty much uh, pretty higher than uh, what we got. We got 125 copies per mil on the uh, flu SARS-CoV-2 multiplex. And with this test, we, they got 2,500 copies per mil, which is pretty decent for no RNA extraction and how fast the assay is. Um, so overall, we tested some positive samples that we had in the lab and our biorepository. On the right here, I want to just point out the detected versus not detected. These are all our values from the fungal reference lab. So our PCR CT values, the higher the CT value, you're going to have lower viral load. Um, so all the, the, the uh, samples that were not detected uh, had a higher CT value, so lower viral load. And mostly due to their, the limit of detection we got is 2,500 copies. So here's Kyogen. Uh, they had about a 90% agreement with us. And then BioGX uh, also missed the same uh, high CT value samples and had a slightly lower 80% uh, positive agreement. So that was all the past work that I've done since I've joined. I'm gonna talk about stuff that I'm currently working on. Um, SARS-CoV-2 subgenomic RNA. We wanted to see if we could design a test that can detect and distinguish between active replication of the virus and then persistent shedding. So do they, are they, do they just have the virus within them and they're shedding it out or are they actively replicating within their cells? So we designed some primer probe sequences for just N1 subgenomic um, portion transcripts for the uh, virus. And we had a positive agreement 20 out of 20, both positive and negative agreement of 100% for this primer probe sequence. Uh, so we move forward, we uh, formulated some standard curves, and we can use these standard curves with both uh, genomic, the N1, the standard uh, CDC original SARS-CoV-2 assay to detect just for N1 genomic material, but we can also use this new uh, primer probe set to detect subgenomic RNA. And so we use this in conjunction with samples to compare with CT values to semi-quantitate how much viral load you have in that sample and how much active replication, if there is any active replication going on by using subgenomic RNA uh, to confer that. And I'm really happy and proud to be working on a couple of projects with Dr. Lund and Dr. Rowe on this. And uh, we'll also be incorporating it to a, uh, a Kappa study in the fungal reference lab moving forward, which is the um, COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis that we're looking into. Um, then finally, I want to finish the talk off with the variant screening. This is the exciting part that I'm really looking forward to uh, of developing and, and using here in the next couple of uh, months. Uh, so we, we want to develop a cheaper, faster, cost-effective strategy to, to uh, identify these variants uh, that keep popping up everywhere. Um, so currently on the left, we're using the Genexus ion torrent. And it's, it's great. It's very user-friendly. Um, but we're limited on sample number that we can run, and it's just uh, 16 samples a day. And then on the right, the min ion by Oxford Nanopore, the little minion there, uh, however you pronounce it, I'll say min ion, but minion, 
whatever works for you. Uh, we're going to try to incorporate this little guy and try to uh, increase our screening efficiency and see if we can get a high throughput method. So again, back to this paper. I love this paper just to look at the architecture of the transcriptome. We're going to just amplify the spike gene. This is the idea behind the project. I've designed and, and ordered some primer sets, uh, one of which uh, spans a little further outside of the spike gene and the other is just within it. Um, ultimately, we're going to move forward with the larger uh, primer set one. So we do get that full spike gene amplicon. Uh, just for proof of concept slide here, we were able to amplify it. We ligated the adapters. It uh, will be the barcoding next. And then uh, we were able to sequence on the min ion. As you can see, uh, the majority of the reads we got were the size of the amplicon amplified. Um, then we did some basic alignment. Uh, this was just my basic alignment, but we'll actually be working with the uh, Dr. Elliot Lefkowitz in his lab uh, for more intense downstream analysis. Um, overall, oops, sorry about that. So overall, we have the Genexus currently uh, sequencing these uh, variants, but we want to get a more rapid cost-effective strategy. So the MySeq is another option, uh, but again, it's it's high, pretty high startup cost. Uh, takes a long time, library prep and sequence it. But the MinION is just a one to two day library prep and then you sequence uh, in little as 10 minutes. And with the new pooling and barcoding idea that we're going to be using, we can get sample costs down to $25 a sample and then a cheap startup cost or a cost-effective startup cost, I should say of $5,000 just for the min I and all the kits you need. So, so overall, this is the, the main idea of the project is to just get it cheaper and get it more efficient. Um, I'd like to thank the whole lab, uh, my director, my mentor, Dr. Sixto Leal, um, and all the collaborators that I've been very, very privileged to work with um, and as well as all the funding. So with that, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you, Thomas. Any questions? Um... My main one was uh, what you finished with as far as the variant identification. Um, how many novel variants are detected? Like how quickly is the virus mutating? So we've been, I mean, we've, we've been sequencing on the Genexus currently. Uh, that's the current uh, um, method of, of sequencing. And we, we identify all sorts of variants all the time. Um, but this could, all, this, you never know what could be due to different Amplicon uh, PCR error in the library prep that the Genexus does, but but overall we are able to identify. I'm not sure the exact number. Um, our lab manager Derek Motes has been driving a lot of the Genexus sequencing, um, but the the port the main idea of this talk was just to give kind of our outline for how we want to move it, and we just want to screen that spike gene. So the Genexus is sequencing the full whole genome. We just want to take that spike gene and sequence it to see if we can screen quicker and then move it over to the Genexus for a full uh, whole genome sequence if we need to. Great. Well, thank you. Any other questions for Thomas? Okay, please join me in thanking all, all, right. all these speakers. Everybody did a fantastic job and really highlighted the diversity of projects and interests in the department. Um, I thank you all and um, and we will hopefully see everybody next week for our final talk um, by Sushant Ketchup, who is joining us from Johns Hopkins. And again, just one more time, thank you for all the excellent presentations. Nice work, organizing. Fantastic. Whoever you are. <laughs>